Probably. Probably. It's probably, I, I, it was the Chinatown special. Yeah, kind of special. <laughs> I tell you, those people ripped you off. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you gotta watch out. Okay, this one. We can say that. <laughs> yeah, they don't say that. All right, so it's R2 plus 1. We actually did this already, but we first saw kind of homogeneous solutions, so this is R2. We know this no already. It's just going to be these guys. This and the minus one. So we're going to have r equals minus one as well as r equals a half plus or minus. Right? Zero, two, that was the one that went with the sum of cubes. Okay. So the homogeneous solution is c1 e to the minus t plus c2 e to the t of the two cosine over t. So now, how do we do the YP? A, T plus B, plus C, E plus T, plus T. Right, so the same principle applies. You make it look like this. That's the first step, the general form of what's here. And then you check, does anyone overlap with what's here? And it turns out C1, E to the T minus T overlaps here. So I'm going to multiply this one by a t, and so that would be the yp, right? There's no difference. You're just dealing with higher degree polynomials, but everything else sort of stays the same. And another difference here is you have to go with higher derivatives. So we're going to take the first derivative. So far, so this is minus c e to the minus t plus two c e to the minus t plus c t e to the minus t. And what do we have? Does anything cancel? at the e to the minus t's, what do you have? Minus c. Just one second. Then why is that a prime? It should be plus c t e to the minus t. Where? This one? Yeah. But it's got a negative c. Negative two c plus c t, right? Well, the negative is in front of it, so uh, this plus. So for what I do was I differentiate the exponential. <laughs> yeah, so what is the minus that here? again? It should be plus c t. Uh, where did I not do that? Yeah. Oh, this here. Yes, that's right. Okay, run the pass. So that would give us. This would give us a plus here and a plus here, right? Yes. Yeah. I wonder if I cancel. Okay. So let's see how that changes things. That's a plus C. And. 
this would be <coughs> 2C, this would be a minus. And everything else should be fine. Okay, so this is a plus C, minus. Now does something cancel? This would cancel with that one, right? Mm -hmm. And we would only have 3CE to the minus T plus AT plus B. So now this just means that we set up our equations. 3C must be equal to 1. Right? So 3C equals 1, which means that C equals a third. Right away, we get that A must be 1. That has to match up here. And B must be 0. This implies um, if I want to do the general solution. but I plug in A equals 1, B equals 0, and C equals a third. Any questions? It's, it's sort of the same game with the second order stuff. It's not. So now, the easy part of the French equation is done. Let's do the hard part. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm kidding. It's all easy. Yeah. <laughs> to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Series. <laughs> Meet again. <laughs> How we missed you. Um, Unfortu unfortunately, we're not going to go as in-depth with series as we did back in count three, but... We're going, to, we're going to more use the elementary properties of series, and um, no, the rest of the class is sort of going to be a review, mostly talking about conceptual stuff. Right? We, we probably won't do many more examples, but um, all the examples will be 5.2 and 5.3, 5.2 and 5.3, but we will start with 5.1, which will be important to remind you of things that you might have forgotten. So chapter five is talking about series solutions to second order linear differential equations. And chapter five, point, section 5.1 is just a review of power series. First, I want to tell you some stuff about series that you might have forgotten in general. Um, and there are going to be important conceptions. So, for example, um, if I have n goes from 0 to m, okay, n, write that without series notation. How do you sort of express this? <coughs> Without the sigma notation. Right, a0 plus a1 plus a2 plus all the way up to am. Right. The infinite case is a0 plus a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus goes on forever. Right. Um, where the a ends are constants. <coughs> and, um, and, right, so they're sort of like functions of n, but when you plug that in, the output is a constant. Right, this is just um, about series in general. And 
Castle. How do we sort of think of this series, the infinite series? What is it defined as? We have a limit definition for it. Remember the limit definition? No. <laughs> okay. So this is you as M goes over right here. Like this, right? And we say the series. Verges that is <coughs> gives a real number as the answer. If the limit exists. Talk more about convergence in a bit, but that's just to remind you of what series look like and how they operate. So basically, this symbol just means add things that look like this over and over and bump them up every time the n increases. N takes on integer values. Um, in this guy here, n is called the index. <coughs> on integer values. I'm going to talk there about shifting indexes and stuff like that. That's why you should know what it is. Index is just the guy down here that we're keeping track of the number. Um, what else? I'm just going to try to go through and give you some of the concepts that we're going to be using. So for one, we need to know how to start a series from a different point. that if I have this guy, n equals 0 to infinity, a n, and I know that's a 0 plus a 1 plus a 2 plus a 3. Let's say for some reason I don't want to start at 0, I now want to start at 2 or something like that, right? How do you think we can do that? Well, I just evaluate it at 0 and 1, and then restart the series at 2, right? I can just think of this here and use a series to describe this. Starting <coughs> at 2. So I can say this is just a0 plus a1 plus. Now I can restart that series from 2 and continue. Right? Or I can do this for any finite number. This is just an example. There might be times where we want to start the series at a different point. You'll see why we want to do that in a bit. Or you can say this is a 0 plus a 1 plus a 2 plus a 3. And then start it from 4. If for some reason that were convenient. Again. 
not a parlor, parlor trick, it's just, it's actually going to be useful. Um, but we'll see it when we actually start doing some examples. What else do I want to tell you? Okay, so also, the first few terms <coughs> are zero, we can ignore them. from n goes from 0 to infinity of a n and I know through some by some means that the first two are 0 for example then I can say this series is just a 0 plus a 1 plus a 2 plus a 3 plus a dot but since this is 0 and that is 0 I can just ignore them all together and just say this series is actually just equal to this series. Right? I'm not missing anything. Right? I can just I can start it from a different point by ignoring zero terms if they're the first few terms are zero. Right? And we'll be doing that soon. Just understand that you, should, you can do that. Trouble with the tripod? Maybe something's too tight. The glare. Oh, you want me to close the window? Close the blinds. <coughs> I'm not like surprising anyone so far. What the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> I've never saw it before in my life. I shouldn't be surprising anyone. Like, what the hell is this? When did we do that? They found this in the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, right? No, I, I can't translate this. Yeah. Technically, we're not to the Calc 3 level yet. This would be stuff that you did when you were doing Riemann sums back in Calc 1. So I thought at least I should remind you of that. What else can we do? Did you write that? I did. Also. We can sum two series together. So if I have n equals zero to infinity to the n, I can actually add this series B n, and I will just obtain A n plus B n. And this actually works plus or minus. You can do that, just combine all the terms. And if each of these converges to a number, this sum will converge to the sum of the numbers. Um, we can also multiply series and divide series, but we, we won't really be doing that, so we'll just be adding them. So just remember that you can do that. Um, what else? <coughs> No, we cannot. All right, so the problem is these two guys have to be the same number the same number for us to actually combine them. If they weren't, which now you're going to see why we'd want to be able to do that, start a series from a different point. There's going to come a point where we want to combine series, and we have to sort of make them like terms, similar terms, similar series, right? So we'll need to be able to, so if this one was at 1, n equals 1, I would need to write this as n equals 1 in order to add it to that. Right? So that's sort of why we need to do that. We're going to be doing this later, adding things together. If the series and this is absolute values converges, we say. 
series is absolutely convergent. <coughs> And absolute convergence is a very important term because um, when we want to use series to represent functions, we need them to be unambiguous. And you learned in Cal 3 that for absolute convergence series, you can rearrange the terms, you'll always get the same answer. Whereas for just convergence series that are not absolutely converted, you can rearrange the terms to get a different answer. So your series can give you different information by just rearranging terms, which is bad. It's very important that that doesn't happen. So this is the golden standard of convergence, and it allows us to be unique. The value of the series will be unique upon reorder, um, which is good. Uh, so now, <coughs> we are going to talk about power series. <coughs> Power series is basically an infinite polynomial, an infinite degree polynomial. So we start from zero. There's something here that's going to give us the coefficients, and then we throw in an x here. Center your power series. We say the series converges at X if. series can actually be thought of being equal to some function that is an infinite degree polynomial. Finite degree if some of the if a lot of the terms are zero. That idea was a huge reason why we studied series in the first place. Basically, it allows us to express different functions as polynomials, which are easy to do calculus with. You know, because you integrate them with the power rule, you differentiate with them with the power rule. So they're very easy to deal with. And as long as these guys converge absolutely, then they uniquely define some function on some interval. So we can actually play around with power series, and it's the same as playing around with functions. And that's sort of where we're going with this. Um, we're going to be playing around with series to solve differential equations. This a few more definitions to go. It's going to be important. It's, it's going to make 5.2 and 3 go by faster when I don't have to stop and explain, okay, this is why this stuff can go. So, um, this guy converges absolutely if, again, similarly, you throw these in absolute values and it converges. 
There are three possibilities for our power series. Case you're just adding zero over and over, so it converts to zero. Two, the series <coughs> converges for all x. Right. So example, we know that e to the x is just the series of x to the n over n factorial. This works for any value of x. Right? Same thing works for sine and cosine. Sine x is just the series from n equals 0 to infinity, minus 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial, etc. Um, <clears throat> the third possibility, the series only converges on some interval. This only works if your x is between minus 1 and 1. It doesn't work in general. So sometimes series will work everywhere, but sometimes they only work on a certain interval. Sometimes they'll only work at a, certain, a specific point. Right? But they will always converge to something. A power series will always converge. It's just a matter of where it converges and what it converges to. Uh, what's well, something else I wanted to tell you about this? R is a real number. Yes. Can you read number two? Number two says the series converges for all x. And that's it. And then I gave you some examples here. Yeah, can you read that for? E to the x is equal to the series of x to the n over n factor. And, and it's sine x equals to the series of minus 1 to the n of x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. Cosine looks the same, except it's not 2n plus 1, it's just 2n. But they work for all values of x. R is a positive real number, and it's called the radius of convergence.
Now, contemplate telling you what the ratio test is and actually doing some examples, but I don't think... For us, that's not important. Let's leave that to the Cal 3 kids. Have them do the grunt work. <laughs> <laughs> We're at the higher level now. We're the senior engineer. You just tell them, like, oh, go compute the series. <laughs> we work on the harder stuff. Yeah, but then they screw up the series and a rocket blows. Yeah, that's why you have to know. You can just look at it until you screwed up or do it again. Right? That's why you have to be like the higher level expert. You can just look at it and like, you screwed up. Okay. Um, something more to the point that we will need is differentiating power series. Besides, there's not there's not even any homework for 5.1, so you're not even going to actually do it anymore, just technically, but. The concepts, the concepts are important for later. For our series and consequences. Okay, so recall we can differentiate our series term by term. to be some power series. Then I should be able to find its derivative, right? And the derivative would be equal to <coughs> I just differentiate this as if it were this is just a constant. I'm differentiating with respect to x, so it's just x minus x not full power. You do the chain rule, bring the power down, subtract one from the power multiplier derivative of the inside, which is one, you end up with n a n. X minus x naught to the n minus one. Sometimes it's convenient to write it series starts at 1 now, instead of starting from 0. Why can I do that? <coughs> hmm? the first, term is first term is 0. If I plug in n equals 0, it kills the first term. So it doesn't even matter. So just to, by what I said earlier, if the first term is 0, you can essentially ignore it and start from where the non-zero terms are. Um, similarly, y double prime, I can just do the second derivative n times n minus 1, a n x minus x naught to the n minus 2, which is equal to, if I choose to write it, I can just start this at 2. Or I could start at 1, and it would actually make no difference. So at this point, you should kind of start to see where we're going with this. We're going to be assuming that the solution to some differential equation has a series form, and we're going to need what is the y prime, what is the y double prime to plug back into the equation, right? This is what they're going to look like. Notes. Our y, we're assuming to have the form a n x minus x naught to the n, which is just a zero plus a one x minus x naught plus a two x minus x naught squared, which means if I evaluate y at the point x naught, what do I get? C 
What's C1? There's no C1. A1X. <clears throat> A1X? No? A0. Oh, right, excellent. Just A0. Zero. Zero. If I plug in X0, I have X minus X0, <clears throat> and that's 0. This will also be 0. Every other term will be 0 except the first term. So plugging in the point where we're centered at just gives me the first coefficient. Um, this one would be 2, A2, X minus X0. Similarly here, if I plug in x equals x0, all these terms go to 0. I'm only left with the first term. So y prime of x0 is going to just be a1. What does this mean for us? Often, we'll have x0 equals 0. So our y would just be the series equals <coughs> to infinity of a and x to the n, in which case our y of 0 would be a0, and our y prime of 0 would be a1. So this is sort of telling you about initial conditions, right? It's sort of, you can actually know what the initial conditions will give you as long as you can figure out the coefficients. <coughs> okay, there's one more concept I want to do. We might have time for an example, I'm not sure. <laughs> I didn't plan on getting to the example, but if, if you can, you might as well. One more concept is the idea of shifting the index. actually dummy variables, just like for um, definite integrals. It doesn't matter if you have a dx or a dy when you show up. It's the same thing. So for example, if I have n goes to 0 to infinity, a n, as long as the a is the same function, I can replace that variable with something else. And I would get the same value. It should make no difference. So. an example of this. Let's say we have the series starting at 2 of a n x to the n minus 2. Let's say that's what we have currently. For example, I, I, that's the result of taking a second derivative and that's what I have. Again, if we're combining power series, we need to combine like terms. So if I want to combine a series that has x to the n in it with something that has x to the n minus 2, I can't do it. So what I have to do is I have to somehow rewrite this as x to the n. And I have accomplished that by shifting the index. What do I mean? Well, we... So I break this into two series, you mean, right? No, we're not going to break it into two series. We're literally going to shift the series over, shift the index over. Um, we can say 
set another variable, m equals n minus 2. This would mean that m plus 2 is equal to n. And then substitute. So we have m equals 2 to infinity of a n x to the n minus 2 should be equal to. Ever I see an n, I'm going to replace with m plus 2. So this is m plus 2 equals 2. A m plus 2. And this is just x to the n. This means now I have n equals 0 to infinity of a m plus 2 x to the m. But because this is just a dummy variable, I can really just rewrite it with n if I wanted to. n is equal to 0 to infinity of a n plus 2 x to the n. Sort of just thinking of this as shifted. I literally shifted every n I saw, I shifted it two places over. Right? I can just, I see this, I don't like it, change all n to n plus 2. Shift it two places over, and I would obtain something that looks a lot nicer, like this. And, and guess what? This gives exactly the same series. I do not lose any information by doing this. You can even check it, right? If I had something like n equals 2 to infinity of a n x to the n minus 2, we'll start plugging in values. When n equals 2, I would have a 2. When n equals 3, I would have a 3x and a 4x squared plus a 5x cubed, and so on and so forth. What does this series actually give me? Well, when I plug in a equals 0, I start at a2, x to the 0. Plus, now I plug in n equals 1, this gives me 3, x to the 1. Plug in n equals 2, this gives me 4, x to the squared. And then if I plug in 3, I get 5, x a5, x cubed. It's exactly the same series. I just wrote it in a different way. I wrote it in a way because if I want to combine with something else, I need to have similar terms. I can't combine an x to the n with an x to the n minus 2. Right? Um, let me just emphasize the equality. So, obtaining by shifting n to n plus 2. Right? And you can shift to, shift to n plus anything, or n minus anything, and you'll maintain the same series, just written in a different form, which is often <coughs> very convenient for combining several series together.
That's what a nonlinear point is. We're, we're going to emphasize the difference between this and similar points when we get later down. But just throwing that out there. We'll see what it means later. Really. I think it's best to actually teach you what this section is about by actually just going through an example. And it's a very typical example to start this off with because it's an example where we all know what the answer should be in any way. So it will be nice when we actually see that it works. actually know what the solutions to this are, right? What are they? <laughs> right, sine and cosine. Right, so it will be C1 cosine and, and C2 sine. So meaning if I solve this using series, the series that I end up with better be the series for sine and cosine, right? Okay, so um, let's actually do it. Um, so what you're going to do, since it's centered at zero, that means that's your x naught. Right? When the <coughs> zero is centered at so I'm just going to set y equals to this power series. And I'm going to want to plug this back into here, so I'm going to need to find the derivatives. So I know that y prime is just going to be the series from 1 to infinity of n a n x to n minus 1. found all the derivatives and now plug into the OD just as a very similar concept. We'll do tons more examples next time. I'm just going to try to run through this. Right. So now that we have this, um, we want to combine the series at this point. We have several obstacles, though. One, they start at different points. Two, they're not similar terms. Three, right? but we fortunately know how to deal with that. Step one, fix the powers, right? Always fix the powers first. This means, in this case, here, Just shift the first series. Which means I can go here to make this a similar term to get this to be x to the n. Literally just replace all n's with n plus 2. Indexes are the same as well. Step two. <coughs> um, 
nothing to do here. So just by fixing the powers that automatically fix the index, we're good. Nothing to do here. But there are times when the indexes might not agree, and how you deal with that is you just evaluate some of the series and, and to start them off somewhere else. We'll do examples of that. This is just one of the first examples. Step three is to combine all the series. series <coughs> that has the similar term x to the n at the end of it. And what I would obtain is n plus 2, n plus 1, the n plus 2, plus just the n. coefficients this I can sort of think as the series of 0 x to the n basically right so we're doing the equate coefficients guys so this means the coefficient of x to the n has to be 0 on this side You solve for the larger index. So I can solve for an plus 2. And this is what I would get. This equation is called the recurrence relation. So this is called a recurrence relation because it's a recursive formula. Basically, you define new terms based on old terms. We call it a recurrence relation when you do that. And so now what we can do is we can actually use this equation to find what the coefficients of our series should be. So for example, a0 here and a1, usually given as initial conditions. We already know that they are the initial conditions. But if not, you just write them in terms of a0 and a1. So now, if I want to know what a2 is, what would you do? <coughs> well, I use a recurrence relation, right? a2 is obtained by using n equals 0 here, right? If I put n equals 0, I get a2. So that's just minus a0 over 2. What about a3? Well, then I just put in n equals 1. And that would give us minus a1 over 2 times 3. What about a4? Well, then I would plug in a equals 2. That would give me minus a2 over 3 times 4. Now, the thing is, you want everyone in terms of a0 and a1. So I don't like a2. What I'm going to do is replace it with here. So in this case, I would get a plus a0 over 2 times 3 times 4. Continue. <coughs> you usually continue as long, in long enough to see a pattern or long, as long as they tell you. Sometimes they'll tell you, only do the first four terms. They might say this, right? But if they don't say that, you try to keep going until you see a pattern. Plug in n equals 3 gives me minus a3 over Four times five 
I don't want A3, just replace it with here. Right? I want everyone in terms of A0 and A1. So A3 is actually A1 over 2 times 3 times 4 times 5. <coughs> Do we need to go ahead? Is it a factorial? It's going to be a factorial. You start to see the pattern already. See, this guy here is A0 over 2 factorial minus this guy here is minus A1 over 3 factorial. This guy here is A0 over 4 factorial. This guy here is A1 over 5 factorial, etc. Right? So this guy here, you can sort of see where this is going. This is actually going to be um, minus A0 over 6 factorial. <coughs> A7 would be, when you do all that, minus A1 over 7 factorial, etc. Okay? So now, we start to see the pattern, and we can write it as a solution. This implies, we assumed our solution was y, which is just a series from 0 to infinity of a n x to the n. Well, that looks like a0 plus a1 x plus a2 x squared plus a3 x cubed plus etc. Which means that is equal to a0 and a1, they are themselves. And I start replacing these guys with what I get over here. So a2, I can replace with minus a0 over 2 factorial x squared. <coughs> a3, I can replace with minus a1 over 3 factorial x cubed. a4, I can replace with plus a0 over uh, 4 factorial x to the 4. a5, I can replace with plus a1 over 5 factorial x to the 5th. a6, minus a0 over 6 factorial x to the 6, minus a1 over 7 factorial x to the 7, x to the And now what you want to do is you want to group things by a0s and a1s, right? So if I group all the a0s, I would have 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x4 over 4 factorial minus x6 over 6 factorial plus a1 x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the 7 over 7 factorial dot dot dot. Ooh, oh, we know those guys. What is this one? That's actually cosine. And this one is actually sine. Now, Obviously, you wouldn't do this for the, the original equation, but there are equations that we don't know the answer to that the series at least offer us some um, insight. Um, by the way, note this is not typical, so don't expect that every one of these problems you do, you're going to get, oh, I didn't recognize that series. It's not going to happen usually. Um, but in this case, it did, and that's where we are. Um, so yeah, kind of rushed through that, but we'll, we'll do a, a lot more examples next time. But that's sort of where we're going. That sort of shows you how to use a series to solve something.